Hello everyone, I'm Sharon Hecker and I welcome you to the final session of our conference. Over the past two days, you've heard from many speakers from all areas of the world of sculpture, curators, scholars, museum professionals, art law and intellectual property specialists, estate directors, artists, publishers, conservators, and market operators. Hopefully your perspective on the challenges of sculpture and catalog raisonnés has widened and even possibly is coming to be transformed by this wealth of new information from so many different perspectives. But what happens when you're a family member or a rights holder of a recently deceased sculptor and are contemplating whether and how to take the very first steps in a way that would respect your artist's intentions? What if you are trained in another profession and are not familiar with the ins and outs of the world of sculpture or the art world? And what if you're a living sculptor contemplating how to leave instructions for your vision for your future legacy? What new tools are available in the digital world for recording and preserving objects such as 3D scanning? And how do they fit into the bigger picture? This final section is titled Preparing for the Future and it will be dedicated to thinking about such questions. In the first part, we welcome Dr. Daniela Markova and Professor Jan Marek, the daughter and son-in-law of a Czech sculptor named Daniela Vinopalova. I became involved with the family because they were contemplating casting into bronze a fragile sculpture called Thanksgiving that Vinopalova had created in paper mache during her lifetime. The family asked me to be an impartial scholarly voice by gathering information for them to be able to make an informed decision about casting Thanksgiving posthumously. They requested from me a reasoned assessment about the most appropriate way to proceed based on my knowledge of the history and problems with posthumous casting in the case of other sculptors. Since Vinopolova had left no instructions or will about her future wishes, I decided to establish threshold criteria for the artist's intentions and then to see whether these criteria supported proceeding with posthumous casting. I did so by conducting interviews with the family, friends, and curators who knew Vinopalova well. I also offered information on the art historical reasoning needed for the estate to make an informed choice. To respect the artist's intentions and ideas concerning casting processes, finishing, and patination, I worked with Vinopalova's trusted Czech foundry to document her process and preferred casting techniques. I also provided considerations and recommendations for best practices of description and recording the transfer of the sculpture from paper mache to bronze. And finally, I provided the family with an overview of best practices regarding labeling the object and accompanying documentation. I'd like now to introduce our four speakers so that they can recount the various aspects of their process from their own viewpoints. I think that when taken together, this story can become a future model for a responsible way to proceed and make informed decisions about posthumously made sculpture. Professor Jan Marek and Dr. Daniela Markova, Matthew Stevenson, who is the representative of the Daniela Vinopalova estate, and art lawyer Pierre Valentin, who is based in London and advises artists and their estates and has been supporting the Vinopalova estate. He will close the panel by suggesting a few takeaways. So welcome. And um, my first question for you both is, uh, who is Daniela Vinopalova? And maybe you can tell us, uh, each of you, a bit about your personal relationship with her and her work, speaking as her daughter and her son-in-law. So Sharon, uh, at first, uh, thank you very much for this great opportunity to tell something about my mother and our relationship and especially about her artwork. So once again, thank you very much. It's not easy for me to tell uh, about our relationship because uh, even it sounds a little bit funny. She was the best mother I can ever have, which is the word uh, telling of everybody, every child. But I think, and I feel it really very deeply. She was, 
And she was not only my mother, she was my best friend all my life. And uh, up to my age, our relationship uh, developed gradually. Uh, at first, definitely, I, I was completely dependent on her. But through the years, the relation became different. The relation became independent, but deeper and deeper, I must say. Even uh, our profession were completely different. And in the beginning, uh, all the members of my family and especially my mother thought that my profession would be something similar like her also. Uh, and I expected too, but it happened at, when I was 15 years old that I had some surgery and my life completely changed. And I must say that at that time, exactly one of the typical features of my mother arrived. So she was very generous to my decision. Even in the beginning, I felt a bit that she was a bit sad because uh, I almost completely at the time gave up this, this field because I had to focus to the medicine and to the medical work, which is very specific, but great too. But even we had these big differences in our professions, we were really close friends. And I think that uh, when I was young, even when I was really small child, I, I tried to understand her work. And the reason when I was really small was that there were a lot of questions from my neighbors and schoolmates. What is your mom's job? And it was not easy to describe it for me because uh, it sounds strange, but, but it was not easy. Uh, the job description <laughs> was not easy. So the description, if somebody, is physician or lawyer or workers or what else? So it's easy. But I, uh, at first, I didn't know what is the best to, to answer, to question, answer. So what to tell to the others. So that was maybe one of the first reasons I asked my mother, what does it mean to be a scout? And from that time, it was something like a beginning to our world, our world of communication. And my mother tried to explain to me up to the level of my understanding, uh, what does it mean to be artist? And uh, even I gave up then this world. I think that it's part of my life even not from the professional point of view, but uh, I keep it in my heart and it's, it's, it's enriched my life, all my life. And I must say even, uh, I feel that even it was uh, great for my husband, it, who was sensitive to this field and who was supported, my mother too. So that was really great. So different profession, but some kind of uh, similar feeling. And, uh, so this is uh, what I what I what I feel. And even even my mother passed away. It will be now four years. I all the time feel it like my part of my life, and I must say that. I could understand different things from her point of view, which was very important for me. And she was really the whole life my inspiration. Uh -huh. So uh, this is Incredible. what, yeah, what yeah, I yeah. want to, to describe about both of us. And I don't know if Jan can tell something about his relationship. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, it was 
uh, you know, we uh, we grew up uh, during the communism, so it was very very tough time. And because uh, when we started dating and later uh, we married, we uh, we couldn't afford the, uh, the our own living, so we start actually sharing the apartment with uh, uh, Danny's parents, and that was uh, how we uh, how we met. How I met uh, Daniela Vinopalova as well. So the, apart from the visiting her studio, so we spent uh, hours discussing uh, uh, her kind of the vision about her life, and of course, I. Because we both are physicians, so uh, although it was very dark times and was very difficult, we still managed to uh, keep our profession. So we were not uh, our profession was not removed. Uh, whereas for, uh, was very difficult for artists because the many artists they uh, were not allowed to work after the Russian invasion in 1968, and she was the one who was very spiritual, very intellectual, very innovative in the 60s and. Uh, and, and she uh, suffered. And, and uh, so, so it was the great time for her between, you know, the 50s and the, until the Russian invasion 1968. And then, uh, then I, I really un start understanding what happened after the Russian invasion because she was not allowed to work, she was not allowed to exhibit. She started actually doing the small things, the jewelry. So you know that she has done a quite nice collection of the jewelry. And then she did it, she just put it in the, uh, in, the in the cabinet because she did it for herself because she was uh, not allowed to exhibit at the time. And, and was for me was the great opportunity to sit and to discuss. And I was very impressed that she actually wanted to talk uh, to me about her work because I was the new member of the family and with a different background, Completely medical. Completely different background. Yeah. And, and then I started to kind of understand how to read the objects, how to read the sculptures, or to see behind, you know, the, 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 the facade of the, of the sculpture. So, and it was, and, and we spent hours this, uh, debating and uh, discussing together, which was rather amazing, I have to say. And then I try always to help, but we need to be very, very uh, careful because we are not allowed to go to the studio for several hours. It was, <laughs> she, she was quite tough, so we, <laughs> we were given the, the hours that we, we could talk to her because she, she apparently, because I, I realized that she lived in the two, two, worlds. Uh, two worlds, one external yeah, and uh, apparently travel. one uh, uh, spiritual. Yeah, yeah. She has, if I can tell something else, so she has the beginning really a small studio which was one room cold really not nice not really dark but not nice to spend much time there and she was so happy there she spent hours working and she protected the space the room she protected um, from the others Sometime when she was uh, sure that the artwork it's really finished and she was happy with that, then it was time to show it at first to us and to her colleagues with the same opinion or similar opinion or meaning. So that so at the time we were invited, but before that it was like a secret. It was like a secret for her, but. Uh, we, everybody uh, from our family respected that. <laughs> so when she, she worked, it was like, okay, don't disturb her. <laughs> it was really nice. And I must say that, that we respected each other in different professions. So she really um, couldn't have the career that she wanted or the international mm -hmm. visibility that she would have wanted because of circumstances, political circumstances, economic circumstances. And also you two were very much part of the most intimate moment after the work is born, right? Because both of you were there to see it and to speak to her about it. So you're very close to her in that way. Um, Matthew, do you want to add anything here? Um, Thank you, Sharon. Um, well, as you know, um, I'm a specialist and advisor in artists and collectors' estates. 
Um, but I didn't know the work of uh, Daniela Vinopalova until I met um, Professor Marek and uh, uh, Dr. Markova. And, you know, this was, a, this was actually a serendipitous moment. This was just pure luck, actually, um, because I first met Danny and Jan um, actually at the residence of the Czech ambassador in London over a glass of uh, Moravian wine at dinner. <laughs> and and uh, I was sitting next to Danny, who I didn't know was the, the daughter of this, this uh, for me, soon to be discovered incredible artist, um, until we really just started talking naturally about art. And, uh, you know, I happened to also represent the estate of uh, Alexander Archipenko. So I was telling um, Danny about uh, an exhibition that we were preparing about Archipenko and his use of negative space in sculpture. And Danny started to speak about her mother and she was saying, well, my mother was a sculptor and she really spoke about space in sculpture as well. And I said, really? And she said, yes. And she annotated a number of her art historical books um, on the subject of Archipenko and Brancusi and space in sculpture. And I said, well, I have to see these sculptures, please, you know, show me something. So um, Danny showed me on her telephone this extraordinary sculpture called Thanksgiving, um, which is the sculpture you mentioned at the, at the very beginning there. And I said, Danny, I'd love to see this work. So um, Danny and Jan invited me to come and visit them in Prague. And I went to the studio and suddenly there was this revelation of this work, this work that this extraordinary artist had created um, in private for much of her life that we don't know outside of the Czech Republic. So for me, who's very curious about artists of the 20th century, especially those in Central Europe, for me, this was an extraordinary discovery. Um, but then there was the challenge of, this is a fragile sculpture. You know, the material that um, Vina Palava had used to create Thanksgiving um, um, in, in plaster and wood and um, chicken wire and, you know, complex materials. And some of the plaster was actually fugitive. And so Danny said, you know, how can we save the sculpture? I mean, we've already tried to find someone who could make a scan, for example, a 3D scan of the sculpture, but we simply can't find the right people and the technology. Um, and I immediately said, I would love to help you, you know, and as you see, um, they're passionate uh, about the, the legacy of uh, Daniela Vinapalava, and I really wanted to help. Um, so that started, that started the journey. Wonderful. Maybe um, the, the two of you could also speak to Thanksgiving and what it is for you and what you remember of it, uh, maybe even personal recollections. I remember the time when my mother has been working on it, and it was after several years and she was really seriously sick. And she recovered even from cancer. And she felt still very fragile, but on the other hand, she was strong. And she was strong enough uh, to complete this work. And uh, it's strange that it was only when she passed away, we talked together with my father about the and about the uh, the type of these uh, of these like uh, egg, which is not only egg, but uh, my father told me, Danny, do you know that this mean two hands like that? You put it together and you pray, mm. and so this was the reason for the Thanksgiving. So oh, this is this was even for me something very emotional, very deep. What I didn't know before, I don't know why, but I didn't know it. And when my father told me this, so I was surprised, and I like suddenly understand much more. So it was Thanksgiving for the years she passed through with the cancer, and she recovered. Hmm. So, this is, and this is, this something is exactly only, what does it mean. Yeah, and only you could have known that. Do you remember any personal stories as well, Jan? Yes, yes, I do, actually. The, the, 
first just put it in the historical uh, uh, context because this was already uh, the the era after 1990, so it was the uh, after the uh, Iron Curtain already, you know, fallen. So she started working very, you know, she 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 was Intensive. blossoming. She was mm -hmm. uh, in the full strength at that time, and then all of a sudden she uh, became sick, very unwell, and then she started recovering. And that's the Thanksgiving is the part of this particular period of her life. I remember uh, 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 the one episode was uh, was was really funny because I told you that we were not allowed to enter the studio, and we were in the the uh, next room, and all of a sudden uh, I heard she was screaming, shouting, and apparently something happened. So uh, we were allowed to enter the studio, and I realized that uh, uh, that the the Thanksgiving uh, model. Has fallen uh, from the uh, uh, how you call it the uh, the the base, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. base, yes, and the then base, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, so we started thinking how we can uh, rescue the object because it was very obvious, it was very beautiful already at this stage. So then I and my the, father I, was there, but has no enough of horses, so Jan came. And me with me and my mother, we were just just a bit crying and shaking. And two men, <laughs> they put their forces together. So and... I've got the idea to take the broom shaft. So I took the shaft and and uh, and just to pull it through the through the object. And I managed to handle it and put it back. And actually, uh, that was my only in all my life that I inspired professional artists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it became part of the artwork because that was one of the questions I had when I was studying is this pole in the middle, is this something that was added or is this something that, and apparently yeah. she loved it so much that she made it part of the artwork. Yeah, so. Added by a cardiologist. <laughs> by a cardiologist. Well, he healed the sculpture. Yes. <laughs> but of course, she then designed, you know, the, yeah. according to her own ideas, but... Uh... Yeah, the prince, the, the idea was his idea, I must say. Yeah, well, that's incredible. Yeah. And Matthew, moving to the step of, of wanting to create a, a bronze sculpture out of paper mache. Yes, well, I think as, as you hear the sculpture, um, you know, it has a fragility about it. So the question for me was, okay, how can we preserve the, the sculpture, but how can we put it into another medium that will make it more resistant. For example, if we wanted to exhibit Thanksgiving in another context, if we wanted to travel it. But the question is, of course, and I have some experience of this with other, other um, posthumous casts, is um, was it the artist's intention? You know, did Daniela Vinopalova want this piece to become a bronze sculpture? <laughs> um, so this was one of the questions, obviously, in, in my mind. And so whilst I was talking with um, Danny, talking with Jan, learning about the artist practice, looking at other work in the studio, looking at and researching other plasters, but also uh, meeting the, the wonderful and knowledgeable curator, Richard Drury, who um, uh, Jan and Danny introduced me to, just who had met, who knew the artist, who had prepared an exhibition and who had prepared a monograph. Um, we began to understand that, yes, it was likely that this sculpture would have been cast in bronze had um, uh, Vina Palava lived longer to see that. But, you know, in the course of her career, you know, casting things in bronze also was expensive and costly. So not all artists of this period were casting in bronze. So there were still some questions. And I think that's what we really wanted to establish, you know, was it the intention? And whilst I had, you know, the family stories, you know, what I had researched, I think this is where it was really important that you came in, Sharon, because we really wanted an independent opinion um, to do some investigation, have some inter interviews, some people that knew Vina Palava and other curators in her lifetime and prepare an independent report so that we could move from that step of, the plaster to creating a posthumous cast. And, you know, it's quite a big step because you really set a precedent 
for the estate with that first cast, how you're going to make it, the additions you're going to make, how you're going to market, is the foundry still around that the, the artists used in their lifetime? So these were very important questions for us at that time, all of which I hope that we, 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 were, uh, we were able to answer and also with your independent report. But I think, Jan, you have, you have something to add there. Yeah, yeah the, uh, just a short comment because We've been discussing already that when when uh, Danny uh, Danny's mom was uh, was yeah. so we started discussing how we can preserve the uh, the sculpture and we so so uh, I tried to help again and that was actually it's very interesting because it was exactly the time we started using the three D printing in cardiology mm. still do it so we do the which is amazing piece of work because then we can you know, do the 3D prints and we are of the heart conditions and then we show it to patients and uh, uh, to ensure that the patient understand what's wrong with the heart. So there was exactly the time when we started using this, this 3D and I've got the idea that we can probably explore whether there will be the, any opportunity to do the, at least this 3D scanning. And I even managed to uh, identify the company, but then uh, we send the pictures and they uh, then apologize. They, they, they don't have the, yeah. you know, the- It was too much data. Yeah, yeah too, too much data. This exactly. was still in her lifetime, correct? Yes, that was still in the, when she was, uh, she was alive, yes. So, so she, we, knew, we knew that she wanted to scan it, which was a yes. very important yeah. step to understanding yeah. that it was okay with her and that it was part mm -hmm. of her attention. Absolutely. And she well, was very uh, sad that- yeah. Yeah, we they're... couldn't find a way. Yeah, and also we interviewed some of her um, uh, friends who were still alive and who told us that she absolutely would have wanted this. Uh, so that yeah. was one of the reasons that we were able to understand that threshold conditions had been met uh, mm -hmm. to make the posthumous cast. And then we got into all the details, which maybe Matthew would like to talk about the foundry. Well, even and before the foundry, you know, we, we, were, we were able to reach out to um, our contact um, um, uh, at Factum Arte, who and Adam Lowe will also be a speaker during this conference. And Adam was fascinated by the work and he dispatched a team uh, to come and scan the piece in the studio because I really didn't want the piece to move. You know, we wanted to keep it exactly where it was, scan it there, and then they were able to make the digital print, uh, incredible in digital print of the sculpture in their studio back in Madrid. So the team came to Prague, they scanned it, they produced the, the model in Madrid. We worked out how the model would be deconstructed in Madrid, shipped, to the foundry, which we visited and really spoke to the foundry and Mr. Horak to understand, could he do it? And was he able to use the same materials, the same alloys that Daniela Vinapalava had used in her lifetime? And I felt absolutely satisfied that he could do that because he knew her and he'd worked with her. Um, so they were able to use the reconstructed model to create uh, the silicon mold, because had we used uh, the traditional method of using a mold on that fragile plaster, we may have, there may have been damage. That's why we also did the 3D scanning. Um, and that started the process of bringing this posthumous bronze into the world. Um, and then we wanted to know how to describe that object correctly, right, Sharon? And that's when we also, you know, you guided us very well in that. Yes, because many times we find later that um, there is insufficient documentation and even mm -hmm. in a hundred years from now, we really want to know exactly how this was made, on whose authority, and with all the details, what kind of cast this is, all the things that art historians look at later and try to decipher, we tried to uh, actually give that information as it was happening in the process. So it was very uh, exciting to be able to be part of that. Um, are there any final um, recollections? I see also that you are wearing some of her creations, uh, Danny. So would you like to talk about that for a minute? This is something, again, it's, it's a small sculpture. It's maybe not a jewelry. And my mother tries so many times to give me some, some gift 
particular gift. And it happened really uh, quite often that when she finished it. So, uh, because I was at the time like a model. So she put it on my neck or on my hand and she told me, no, it's too big. It's a sculpture. You can't wear it. <laughs> and it was for many time, but this was one of the really uh, uh, jewelry which you can wear and I love it. And I feel it, it's with a stone and I, I don't know the name, but it's, uh, it's heavy, it's silver and stone and it's part of my mom. Hmm. Lovely. And she really had to work small because she had no choice, right? I mean, she could not make the big sculptures that she would have wanted. So yeah, uh, she, she, she didn't it. allow to do it. And um, honestly, we even didn't have uh, enough of money to, to pay for it because it was really expensive. And uh, when the time when the gallery bought several of her works it was finished in, in the 70s. So then really it was quite difficult to, to do the realization of these big subjects, which my mother really do and was involved in the big things, big sculpture. And, and this is the, uh, like the artwork towards space. And it was huge things, heavy things, but she couldn't. So the only one possibility was just to decrease the size and to, to, to make small artistic objects, but I, again, sculptures. Yeah. I also remember that, you know, the one important, I think the characteristic feature was that she was completely non-commercial. She was not. And uh, <laughs> she, she was, you know, full of energy. She tried to always to express herself. But uh, of course, she, there were the limitations, and uh, and she was just trying to produce, produce, produce. But she uh, even she was not allowed to work officially. Uh, she she was still thinking about art. Her life was the yes. art. Her life was family and art, nothing else. I must say, hmm. and. Uh, Till the end, we have only one if it's not, um, disagreement. disagreement, really, because we were so close. And it was time when uh, she fell down and she broke seven ribs. And uh, she recovered, it took three months. And I really told her, please, mom, don't continue with your work. It's hard. And she has even some stairs. So she worked on a quite high level. And I worried a lot. It was only one of these disagreements. She told me, Danny, please not. I will not accept your no, wish. Okay. So uh, I have to continue. So this is like, for her was life. Wow. It's just to describe her. Unstoppable. 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 Yeah. Unstoppable. That's an incredible <laughs> story. And it's good that uh, we are able to continue now her legacy as uh, the protectors of her legacy as well, together yeah, with Matt. That's really great. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really an incredible story and to have some people who are so close to her. Um, maybe Pierre, could you speak a bit to sort of your position and how you support the estate and maybe there are some takeaways from this story that other artists and um, estates and families could learn from it? Thank you, Sharon. Yes, I mean, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief and uh, there are really three takeaways um, from, from this conversation. The first for me is we really need to encourage practicing sculptors to recall their intention regarding posthumous casts. It, what matters is that they consider the issue, make decisions about posthumous casts and recall those decisions in writing. It's simply done. I mean, they can include that in their will or in a separate 
separate letter of wishes. Secondly, if a sculptor, ha a sculptor has not left a written record of their intention regarding posthumous casts, the, inqui the inquiry that you conducted, Sharon, to establish the intention of Daniela Vinopalova are a model of best practice. You, you, because you diligently interviewed contemporaries of the artist to establish what they said she would have wanted. Now, in your case, a consensus of opinion emerged. That may not always be the case, but when it does, the representatives of the estate have a roadmap that gives the production of posthumous cast a legitimacy that they would not otherwise have. And finally, and this is not something that has been brought up, but I, I'd like to bring it up because, you know, I, I, with my hat on as, as a lawyer, um, it's important to consider the legal framework in the country where the posthumous castes are being made. Now, not all countries have a legal framework to assess when a caste is original, as opposed to copy or replica. But the, if there is a framework, you ignore it at your peril. A famous example is France, where as a matter of law, the number of editions of a sculpture cannot exceed 12, or the editions are no longer, no longer considered original. Um, so if you produce posthumous casts in France, you should at least apply the rule of 12 um, if you want to stand a chance to be able to call posthumous casts original casts. Uh, it's not as simple as that, unfortunately, but the rule of 12 is cast in stone, so to speak. Thank you so much. And um, being able to hold together the practical side, the emotional side, the organizational side, it's no small task for uh, families, for estates, and for living artists preparing their legacies. So um, I hope that this panel has been interesting and instructive on all of those levels at once. My name's Adam Lowe. I uh, direct Factomati and I founded Factum's Foundation uh, to apply technology to record at high resolution uh, in three dimensions and in various forms uh, a wide variety of cultural heritage for uh, preservation, for condition monitoring um, and for general in-depth study. Um, in 2019 we were asked uh, by the Victorian Albert Museum by Anna de Benedetti to record uh, with a 3D scanner developed in Factum all of the um, uh, cartoons by Raphael. Um, I mean, most of you, I think, will know the gallery space. And as the cartoons hang, they hang high up on the walls in this very large, beautiful, uh, and even more beautiful now it's been restored gallery. But they're behind glass and they're without daylight. So um, part of the project was to reveal uh, the character and surface of the cartoons themselves and to provide data for in-depth study. Um, at the beginning of 2020, just before lockdown, uh, one of the cartoons, The Sacrifice of Lystra, uh, was shown in the exhibition uh, at the Quirinale, uh, the Scuderi de Quirinale in Rome um, as part of the Raphael exhibition. Uh, it was shown in facsimile form, where we made an exact copy of the color and the surface to scale. It was shown low down and without glass. Um, what that means effectively is you're not just looking at the colored surface, the colored image, as you can see here on the left, but you're looking at both the image and its material presence. Uh, and the image on the right here, I think is very, very clearly um, uh, revealing what happens when uh, the surface and the image are seen at the same time. Uh, what I love about many of the projects we do um, is that they reveal uh, and raise questions. So Anna de Benedetti arranged a series of meetings between different specialists. Uh, we're simply providing the data for the specialists to look at and discuss. Um, and with Arnold Nessler, we then went on to record uh, the sacrifice at Lystra Tapestry in the Palazzo Ducal in Mantua. Um, uh, why did we do this? Well, I think the, 
the answer in the next slide of the hands is you can see clearly the punch marks that are on these cartoons. Um, and one of the things that fascinated uh, Arnold Meserat and myself is why are these cartoons, which were made for tapestries, punched um, or pounced? So the pouncing is highly detailed. Um, and pouncing would normally be done to make a secondary uh, copy, not to make uh, a low warp uh, tapestry. So I think there are a lot of questions that need to be asked. In two months time, we'll be going to Shanti to record the three fragments they have there. And Arnold Nesselrat is now working to gain permission uh, to uh, uh, record um, the two cartoons that are in Dublin. What's happening is that uh, through the recording and the 3D scanning, a series of questions were coming up. I should say we also did high resolution color and uh, infrared recording uh, of the VNA cartoons. But this data, when it's all brought together, raises many, many questions. Um, just as a little aside, one of the things that we do in Factum uh, is to uh, study and build technologies that enable us not only to record, but also to output. So the video that's on screen now is a video showing an elevated printing system, which prints in five micro layers. It was designed originally by OSE that were then taken over by Canon. And the version we have in fact is the, currently the only elevated printer out of their research department in Venla. And I've been working with OSE first and, and Canon more recently to try to perfect, perfect the elevated printing. Here in Factum, in, in this slide, that clearly is a reworking, it's a three-dimensional reworking of the sacrifice of Mistra. Um, and for an exhibition that's coming up in Vicenza um, in the spring, which will look at uh, Raphael as an architect, we're starting to use the same information to rethink uh, the content of the sacrifice of Lystra by Raphael and his workshop um, in a very different way. So I want to move and a jump and the, the image that you've got now is an image of the Goff map in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And five years ago, we uh, were asked by uh, Jerry Broughton and Nick Millet uh, at the Bodleian to scan the surface of this map. So we scanned the front, uh, and we scanned the back uh, of the map. And we then handed the data over to the library. So Factum has a very clear policy about data that it must always belong to for all current and future applications, the custodians of the work of art. And what happened next is everything I love. And I think it's why I use these two examples of pouncing. Because you can see the front and the back, Catherine Delano Smith and the team from Imagio Mundi, uh, uh, with a Leverhulme scholarship, uh, Leverhulme grant, started to do in depth research. And what they noticed, uh, which you can see down the left hand side of this slide, is that the surface uh, pouncing marks most of the time don't go all the way through. So their current thought is that the map is actually a derivative map from another map. And um, they're now uh, working on this um, in the next round of, of funding to really carry out an in-depth study uh, of the Gulf map. But what they asked is we recorded the surface at 100 microns. Could we record it at much higher resolution? So um, uh, in a new initiative funded by the Hel Helen Hamlin Trust, uh, which we're calling Archeox, the analysis and recording of cultural heritage in Oxford, We've developed a photometric stereo system, which can record the surface of the Goff map and other two and a half D surfaces at a resolution of about 25 to 30 microns. So about three times higher than the normal uh, scanner we use. Um, I think the question I'm often asked at this point is, you know, where did all this come from? Where did it start? How did you start doing it? Well, I don't want to go back to the beginning but I want to focus on what we started doing in 2016 with the Fondazione Giorgio Cini and the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne um, in Venice. And that has resulted in the creation of Archive, 
the analysis and recording of cultural her heritage in Venice. But for the project in Luchini, we built a scanner uh, that uh, could record at high resolution double-sided images. So it's a, basically a photographic scanner. And uh, it automatically captures and downloads, uh, in this case, the front and the back of um, each image. We've recorded over a million images now. Um, uh, and they've been fed into um, a machine learning software. The machine learning software is analyzing um, iconographically similarities in images. So it, it's giving you a whole new way of searching. I think this is one of the themes that I'd like to, in a way, bring up as and foreground in this conversation. So how you search an archive, how you look for things, determines what you find. So with the screen that the image now shows, the Lucida scanner recording one of Goya's uh, black paintings, the famous dog. Um, and we recorded all of Goya's black paintings. Um, and we uh, worked with the Prado over a period of about a year to uh, show uh, what you could do when you bring all of the data together. So when you bring um, uh, color data and surface data. So on the screen now, you can see Saturn eating his child uh, and you can see the surface of that painting. As you zoom in, you can see uh, that right down uh, at the smallest detail. So we're recording these paintings at one-to-one -one at 700 DPI, and we're recording the, um, uh, the, the 3D at about 100, so the surface of the paintings at about 100 microns. But we can start building multi-layered archives, multi-layered uh, files that allow you to look at X-ray data and juxtapose that with surface information, or allow you to compare color with infrared, or allow you to compare uh, any other of the types of data with the historical photographs. Um, and for me, the real excitement here is you've got a discourse game. You've got in one place something you can focus on. So you can also note it, notate it. You can have conversations both physically and online. And I think this merging of online and offline is critically important to the data we're recording now. So I'm just back from Cleveland, Ohio, where last week we were recording um, the El Greco crucifixion. Um, the reason we were doing this is in Bishop Auckland in the north of England, uh, where we've been working on Jonathan Ruffer's Spanish gallery. Uh, they have an almost identical painting. Um, we'll be recording the painting in Bishop Auckland very soon. But uh, this is part of a research project to look at El Greco's painting. For me, El Greco is one of those great idiosyncratic painters, but he's also a painter who worked in a studio. And I think starting to understand the hand of El Greco. So now on the screen, um, uh, previously you were looking at the baptism, now you're looking at El Greco's Annunciation and the vision of St. John. And we're both trying to reunite these paintings and uh, get permission to make facsimiles to put them back into the hospital of Cardinal Tavera. Um, very, very quickly, in, in Bishop Auckland, um, the, this project has started being focused uh, because we've been looking at El Greco as a sculptor, El Greco as someone who builds architectural tabernacles, as well as studying his painting. And one of the exciting subtexts of this, and I'm getting more sculptural in a second, but one of the exciting subtexts of what we're doing is the research often throws up very interesting discoveries, like the tabernacle had a top layer, uh, which was destroyed in the Spanish Civil War. And the tabernacle actually is an automata. So the idea of El Greco building automata uh, changes the way I think about him, and I hope it changes the way everyone thinks about him. So he's doing sculptures as well as painting. I'm going to finish El Greco in a second, but I want to just show you the kind of tableau that we're building. To me, this is a, a sort of catalogue raisonné uh, of uh, uh, Spanish um, uh, objects that can't move. So how do you uh, record them digitally, and what forms can you study them in? seem to be the very pertinent questions. So back to El Greco for a second. El Greco and his hands. 
the brush marks, what are we looking at? How do we know a brush mark is by El Greco or by his son, Jorge Manuel, or by many members of the studio? Well, recently, uh, Mike Daly uh, has been writing about the um, uh, painting um, uh, by Rubens uh, in the National Gallery of Samson and Delilah. Uh, and many people are observing that uh, machine learning is being used to analyze the brush marks. As I look at the information uh, Michael Daly published, uh, I would say just looking at the brush marks, you can say they don't look like uh, um, uh, Rubens brush marks. But with um, El Greco, what we're doing is we're recording more and more paintings and we're um, starting to uh, analyze those with machine learning uh, software that isn't reading brush marks. It's not reading the things we have names for. It's reading the data in abstract ways. The painting we've done most research on so far is the um, uh, portrait of Cardinal Tavera by El Greco that was badly damaged in the Civil War and heavily restored. So we know bits of this painting are new, and we're now able to analyze um, the uh, uh, different parts of the painting, and uh, we're getting some remarkable results. So very soon, I think, um, uh, from uh, Ken Singer's research uh, group at Cleveland, we'll be uh, revealing how three-dimensional recording can reveal the hand of different artists. But to start to wrap up, I mean, what I, I love about uh, the work we're constantly asked to do is we're able to go deeper and deeper. And if a catalogue resume allows you to do one thing, it's to really understand an artist in depth. Uh, one of the projects we've been working on uh, for a couple of years now is to um, uh, record all of um, uh, Velasquez's paintings uh, done at the beginning of his career. So far, we've recorded four of them. Um, and I hope soon the National Gallery in London and the National Gallery in Dublin and then others will give us permission to extend this. But just recording uh, the water cellar of Seville and being able to study it at this depth and to compare it with the old woman cooking eggs or to compare it with the two men eating at humble table or uh, the other paintings we've recorded so far gives you a real sense of actually how the young Velasquez was changing, what he was able to do. And if you can see the color, the three dimensions uh, and other levels of information where they exist, you can start to get a complete picture. Uh, with Cecily Holberg in um, the Academia in Florence, uh, we've just uh, been working on a project to record all nine known casts of Daniel de Volterra's portrait of uh, Michelangelo. And I think the research here, which is going to be displayed um, in uh, 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 Florence in March, uh, is going to reveal many things about casting techniques and about how Daniel de Volterra or, or the technicians he was working with uh, produced their uh, their cast, how much they change one from another. How much can we talk about um, the wax original or the bronze copy? So to me, I think the idea of a bronze original is already quite a strange contradiction in terms because it's a cast. It's made from something else. Um, with uh, Sharon Hecker, we were asked to um, start to record Medardo Rosso's uh, waxes so that Sharon and others can carry out an in-depth study and look at how he was uh, working on them. Um, and very recently, uh, we were asked to record uh, the Grinling Gibbons uh, carving of uh, Tintoretto's crucifixion in Scuola San Rocco, which is in Dunham Massey. And this really was a challenge. I mean, anyone who knows the complexity of Grinling Gibbons uh, knows how dif difficult that is. But really, I want to end uh, on a note that's important and I think important um, for everyone is that the kind of recording we're doing uh, often raises many uh, questions about ownership, um, about um, uh, rights, um, and about the commerce of art. 
So recently we were asked by um, the family uh, uh, of Tatiana Drachevskaya, um, uh, who committed suicide and her tomb uh, in uh, Montparnasse Cemetery has Brancusi's kiss uh, on it. Uh, we went and we scanned Brancusi's kiss, which is currently covered uh, by a box. Um, and uh, the question is whether this sculpture, which was made in uh, 1909, uh, uh, she committed suicide in 1910, and the family built uh, the tomb in 1911 and put the sculpture on it, uh, whether this sculpture belongs to the family or the French state. And the legal discussions around this are complicated. My interest in this isn't about the money or about the sculpture, it's about the preservation of the object. So what you can see is the sculpture is very vulnerable uh, in the graveyard as it stands, especially now it has the value it does. Um, and we are, uh, by recording it, uh, generating the data that will lead both to an understanding of it, but also its preservation. So I think at this point, I've stretched my 10 minutes to the limit. So I must hand over to Andrew, uh, to Andrew Lacey, uh, who I hope will uh, take on the theme in uh, casting and Ron's work. So thank you, that was brilliant as ever. Adam, you completely blow my mind by the things that you're doing, you're working on. So my name is Andrew Lacey. I'm an artist and a founder and an explorer in a way of historic bronze culture, which I'll explain later. Um, when I was first asked to consider posthumous casts, I have to admit, I found it completely perplexing as an idea for an artist. Uh, it assumes two things. One, that you are dead, or at least will be dead shortly or at some point in the future. And the other is that all the work that I have done in my lifetime could possibly be recreated by someone else who I don't know. And this I find most perplexing and most worrying. And having seen the Vinipalova uh, case in which obviously Sharon Hacker led and Adam was involved with that in creating the, the wonderful sculpture itself, and I had some input as well, it makes me think that there is a necessity at some point for a protocol to be made. Because in essence, if you ask the right questions, getting a good and reliable casting should be very easy. It should be very easy. The further you go back in time, the more complex that becomes. But for relatively modern artists, there shouldn't be the discrepancies that we do see sometimes when we see posthumous casts made. Now, I wanted to just briefly go through, kind of extrapolate, go further on that idea, and look at my own sculptural output from my studio, uh, which I've broken down into three sections. And the idea of this is just to suggest where we find advantageous material, things which are useful and should go into the collection resume, or at least be discussed, and things which are possibly erroneous, dangerous, uh, illicit. And I'll explain that in more depth now. So the first image that we have is from our sculptural output. It's a recent sculpture. It was done in the last year and it's part of a larger piece. It shows a horse's head. And what I want to describe here is the subtlety of the, the surfaces. When we're looking at sculptures, if you can relate back to one other of that edition, one of the problems is I don't make editions. I'm very bad as my agent will tell you, at making additions of anything. So I make something similar, add repeat. But this piece gives an indication of my intentions and the way that I work, the subtlety of the patina and the nature of the surface. It also means that the sculptor's own or the sculptor's own uh, photography of their work is of paramount importance in terms of evidence of what we're looking at. So that's the first one. The second image is the wax model that it came from. Now this is a hollow wax model at half scale. The thing with this one is that although it's the wax model 
and the previous sculpture, which is in bronze, should have come from this one. It came from an earlier um, iteration of it. And this model that now sits in my studio just keeps getting tinkered with. And you can see the scratch marks on the neck. Well, in the little initials and things that are words that are starting to form on, on the body of the, the horse. The point with this is I've taken it out of its proper um, chronology. Now we're starting to change the, uh, the nature of the, the, the sculpture, even though there has already been a first initial bronze taken from it. I'm now starting to go back to the original model and change it. These add complexities to understanding the chronology of a piece of work and what really needs to be looked at and considered as being the original or authentic or desired or intentional surface of bronze. The next one is the mold, which is really simple. If we find the mold, then we should assume that this is one of the best objects that we can relate to in terms of um, getting the accuracy that we need to recreate that object, that sculpture. But of course, molds are three-dimensional objects. They are prone to warping, moving, changing. They sometimes get eaten by mice, which happens in my studio quite often. And they change by a series of uh, entropy. The surfaces and structure and form changes over time. So although they are very good pieces of evidence, they do need to be considered as being accurate. There's nothing worse than this next image will show a wax that has been taken from a mold, which also may exist in the studio, which then slowly moves or shifts or succumbs to gravity over time and then becomes changeable, different from the original intent. It shifts. There's nothing worse than seeing a wonderful kind of figure that's been made in wax only to slowly move over the gravity of time and shift into something that's lackluster and doesn't have that same vigor as the original form or concept. We then have things like plaster master copies. This is one which I've just sent to Phantom. It's good because it gives me any researcher the idea that this was the object that was intended to be cast at that particular moment. It's harder than the wax, it's more resilient. Um, and it gives all the, it's more sustainable in terms of its uh, form and its geometry. It doesn't succumb to those sort of things. Um, and it gives fantastic detail. You will see the scratches on the neck, which are important to me, but not aberrations that have happened over time, not burnishing of time. These are things which are kind of critical to me because they become woven into the story of the narrative of this particular uh, sculptural piece. So in capturing those, which the mold hadn't previously, we see the, the scan, which Factum have actually just done just recently, only a couple of weeks ago, high, super high resolution. And I must admit, my initial feelings about scanning was that I was skeptical there's still a degree of potential loss. But when Factum have done this, I have been completely won over and I can see how fine the details are and the resolution is exceptional. And when we look at things like the neck, we can see the scratching on the neck has come out impeccably well. And I know that that can then be recreated wonderfully in the future without my having to worry about its exactness and its sharpness and the subtleties of its surface. That said, my skepticism is warranted. In this image, we have an image of uh, the horse modeled in full, when it was an early uh, version a year or so ago. And the university, a university, an institute was invited to come and scan this for me. The scanning was really disappointing. It's not as sharp, it's not as crisp, it's not as high resolution. It feels lackluster. It's almost like going back to an iteration of a wax, which has succumbed to time and become warm you know, in the surface. Details have been lost. What was worse than that was when they sent the scan away to be uh, reproduced as a three-dimensional print, the company that made that print went bankrupt, 
the scan was lost. And now, not that I care for it, but all of that material has disappeared and I have no trace of it. So it's that digital material, that digital data is still susceptible to entropy loss and theft. So it's really frustrating. The next image, now I'm peculiar because I also x-ray a lot of my own work because I like to find evidence and secure evidence of my own practice. The x-rays obviously wouldn't count for most artists who produce bronzes, but on the rare occasion when people have studied in depth, we see things like this and it maps out wonderfully the physical structure, the nature and the choices made in creating a bronze sculpture down to how the things piece together, the assembly lines, the pinning, the thicknesses of the wax, everything is mapped out within these uh, x-rays. But then we also have, and unfortunately I don't have a drawing of the horse because a lot of my work have just moved and a lot of my work is in storage and in archives. Um, drawings, sculptural drawings are fantastic resources and point the way to a lot of evidence of uh, intention, but also in thinking about Adam's work, the potential for extrapolating into the future new works that haven't been created in the artist's lifetime. Perhaps we'll discuss this later. The other thing also is I tend to make lots of diagrams and maps of thinking and the mathematics behind making the sculpture what is needed to make a, a kind of engineered form and just the mathematics or playfulness of trying to create something in my head before I've made it in the uh, three-dimensional form. All these are powerful bits of information for recreating my work in the future, if my work was going to be posthumously, posthumously cast. The second area, because I'm unusual in this, is experimental bronze casting. And the reason behind that is we can forget, we don't need to worry about bronze casting per se in terms of tradition, because I'm not particularly interested in that. What I am interested in, in the, in the essence of cast of my own work, is how I can take the process further uh, and find ways where I can intervene or intercept the process to extend my aesthetic uh, potentials. So the modeling or the sculpting doesn't just stop when the casting process begins, the idea is that it goes further and that those things, no matter how arbitrary, or I think in the case of uh, Madara Rosso, the flaws and the wonderful kind of surfaces, which are aberrations from the casting process itself, influence and make these wonderful textures and change the way the modeling uh, was originally created. Initially to do that, I was using techniques like uh, x-ray, video x-ray uh, radiography, where I could actually see metal being poured into the mold and see flaws and problems occurring, and then even know then how to manipulate them or incorporate them into work. Since then, this short film, about 10 seconds, shows a fused silica or fused quartz mold. So it's made of different components, but the window is fused quartz, which means that I can pour at super high temperatures into a mold and actually see what's going on. Because for me, that's massively important. Again, it's not to backward engineer or kind of find analysis from this. It's trying to find ways in which I can intercept the casting process and take it beyond what I could originally imagine so that I can change the nature of my sculptures. Some of these things end up as artifacts in the studio. And the two bells here are originally cast, the top parts are cast from pure experimentation, which were pushing the limits of what I thought I could do. They've been fused onto bells to make a kind of sculptural object. Now, my studio is full of objects like this. And at the moment, I consider them as non-art objects. Until they're given purpose, they are non-art objects. But if someone came into my studio and was to gather a lot of these things, 
the potential is that they, they point the way, they point the direction and the intention of my philosophies and thinking for future works. And it would not be hard to actually take them and create new assemblages for works which haven't yet existed. The next mold, or the, sorry, the next slide is of a mold which is yet to be filled, purely experimental. And again, something that I will return to, probably don't need to do it just yet, but it's changing the nature of how I create bronze casts. And these things are very important for me in terms of gathering evidence of thinking patterns so that when something is cast in the future, uh, posthumously, they have to be considered as a textual element of the object or significant component of the object, of the bronze cast. The last section that I just quickly want to talk about is uh, explorations in historic bronze culture. And what that means is I've spent a lot of, a lot of my time looking at past methods of making older sculptors um, and dissecting their work, looking at the analysis of uh, what makes up their sculptures, you know, the, the technical analysis. But then going beyond that, and this is usually working in conjunction with institutes and museums, is to take a piece that they are investigating at the moment and recreate it from scratch as closely as possible so that we can then dissect it later and see if the thinking that happens there and the material structures, the material evidence that we find can uh, uphold hypotheses that are being created around these artists. It's a complicated way of backward engineering, dissecting work which couldn't otherwise be dissected. And in a way, this next slide shows exactly that. But I also find it as an artist, utterly Bagali. It's of a Priya acrobat and the core that holds the inside of it hollow, that creates the inside of it to be hollow. And I find these as sculptural objects, which I created from the evidence of the original bronze, totally wonderful and Bagali beautiful objects. And it made me start to change my mind again about what I consider to be uh, what is important with bronze sculpture. Is it the surface? Is it that membrane which makes up the thing that we see? Or is it the, all the layers that go beneath that that then create the body, the core, the anima of that work? And for me, that's suddenly taken over. That's suddenly become a narrative in its own right, which is of interest. And so now a lot of my bronzes are open at the back or underneath and reveal their interiors. Going back to recreating uh, the bronzes from scratch um, in a way to kind of backward engineer them, things like neutron scans provide great evidence. They are not particularly easy to get hold of, but create the most wonderful, glorious amount of imagery when you can spin them around and see all the artifacts inside and how they interplay and make sense of the object. From that, I then made waxes. In this case, this is one of the Rothschild bronzes, which was recreated in order to understand it better, and why one of them was flawed and one was not out of these two figures. The next slide shows two figures which have two correspondingly different uh, surfaces. One is deeply flawed, the other one is pretty much exactly the same as the original sculpture. The reason why I'm showing this is that I now have a studio full of beautiful, exquisite models, casts, uh, relics that peculiarly the Institute doesn't want once all the evidence has been gathered and now sits with me. Now these are in all honesty, posthumous casts, which I had never considered in that way, but they are tight, perfect posthumous casts, which don't have a home. And so when I go, they will enter the world and probably muddy uh, the various history lines of these artists. Worse still, in this last slide, or this next slide, is uh, there's a collection of objects to the right-hand side 
there was a half mould, plaster mould of a Sassini horse. To the left side, there was a core from the Rothschild bronzes. And to the top, there is a head of uh, one of the Rodin figures of the Burgers of Calais. The reason why that's there and has entered my studio, along with all the hundreds of other curious objects, is because at some point in the late 90s or 2000s, uh, a budding student, art student, decided they wanted more uh, close-up material of this burger of Cote de Calais, dressed themselves as a council worker, climbed up, took a mould from the piece, and then since then, that mould has done a wondrous tour of the London Art Foundries and various other studios, variously being taken as plaster casts, but occasionally, like this last image here, uh, turned into beautiful bronze casts. They are completely illicit. They exist everywhere. They are probably a nuisance and again, muddy the waters for finding out which are authentic lifetime casts and those which are nothing to do with editions or the artist's intention. So lastly, all of these pieces of evidence and ways of thinking and observations and personal practice have become over time enmeshed. And now my personal output, my personal sculptures, no longer fit within a traditional form. You could not take any one of those and suggest that it has come from a normal art foundry. They are too uh, random and artisanal and affected by other con considerations to be considered anything of those. Uh, the example that I give here is a horse and bell, which is part of an installation called Iconoclash. And it still relates to that very first head, but the modeling and the reason for its being has changed and moved on into a different sort of format. The installation itself is complex and follows a very complex uh, narrative. It will include other casts, waxes and different forms. These are all mutable, they will change. And as such, I will show you just this last short 30 second film. So the bell was shot using sniper rifles. And it's to do with a performative nature of this object. It was meant to be destroyed. It will then have another history laid upon it. It is to do with a lot of complex histories that have happened in time. Now that bell, has been deeply wounded, its voice has been broken, and I'm very interested in those voices, those bells. And right now, this bell has gone to Fatimate to be scanned. It leaves me in a peculiar position because this has gone through a performative element which has existed after the casting of the bell. So it's had its birth, it's come into the world, and now has a, a choreography, an act of violent act and a performance that has happened to it. So how do we integrate that into the posthumous cast? So if I was going to recreate this or someone was going to recreate this for me in a hundred years time, where do we stand? How do we recreate it? Because my practical mind would say, it is simple. We have it scanned, Adam can then take every element of that and recreate it perfectly down to a micro and or hundred microns. And it will be a near perfect copy of that original bronze or that bronze. But then my artistic side, my artist side would say, for sure it's more valid to recreate the bell and then go through the performance, which is incredibly important narrative upon this piece and have it shot. And then my more poetic side would say, surely the bell should be healed digitally and made whole again and its voice given back, which is something that could perhaps happen in a digital phase of its lifetime. So this has left me in a perplexed situation where I know not which way to turn when it comes to my own work and the posthumous cast. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, I think, I mean, what comes across when you're talking very strongly is this whole sense 
uh, that the uh, the meaning, the subject, the inspiration lies in the materiality of what you do. Um, and I think uh, the whole question about the bell um, uh, raises many, many questions about, in a way, whether the work of art was the performance, whether the work of art was casting the bell, whether the work of art was shooting the bell, whether the work of art's rescanning a shot bell. And in a way, all of these are, are material transformations uh, that clearly you relish, that you uh, love the materiality from the inner core uh, to the molds themselves. Do you want to enlarge on that a little bit? I do, and I have to say, I mean, it's from seeing your work, which has made me so much more perplexed because I can see Oh, I can see the potential of what you can do, you know, the, the whole idea. Again, I would say I was always a bit skeptical with scanning, but then seeing the depth that you can go to and, he, and what was fascinating to hear about the AI in terms of El Greco and being able to then differentiate between different hands. And of course, apart from in my case, I create all my own sculptural work, but in most artists are art foundries. They are created by a number of hands. Lots of different people are involved in this and lots of different influences happen upon those sculptural objects. And the further back in time we go, there will be more and more different hands as evidence on these. It's left me in a position where I have to consider the potential of what you do as an extension of what my imagination might somehow reach to, because that idea that anything could be recreated or healed as in the bell or its voice uh, manifest and reformed is fascinating. Well, the reason I started with Raphael um, is the uh, Raphael cartoons, which probably are the, you know, the greatest uh, Italian Renaissance paintings out of Italy. Uh, you know, they're there, but uh, Raphael ran a studio a bit like Factum. I mean, they were, uh, you know, uh, painting frescoes, uh, restoring uh, antique sculptures, uh, uh, doing interior design, uh, working with silver, you know, there's a whole range. So who painted, which hands painted the Raphael cartoons? How much of the Raphael cartoons were painted by Raphael? How much by Giulio Romano? How much by many others whose names we might not know in common parlance? But of course, you know, what was the dynamic of the studio at the time? And then uh, how were they used to make the tapestries? Were they uh, valued at the time and so not cut up? Uh, hence they were pounced to make a derivative set that were cut up to be used to weave the tapestries. I mean, there are so many questions. And, you know, then you're into who's dyeing the threads, who's doing the weaving, how many hands are working on the tapestries. And then of course, uh, the, uh, the, the subject just grows exponentially once the, the cartoons come to England and then Mortlake and then wherever you want to go. So I think this idea which you personify of, of you know, the author artist who is making every mark and takes responsibility for it. So I understand the idea that a scan can capture those marks. Uh, it's both an additional tool as well as something uh, to, to threaten. Yeah, and I think that's where I'm starting to see the, the use or the potential scanning as a kind of future tool for creating new works. Now, I'm just wondering, you probably can't talk about this because I guess you're in mid-flight with the, the, the Michelangelo busts, the uh, Volterra busts. But do you see, I would love to know whether you see different hands, different expressions, different ways of creating those seven busts because I know one of them, I think it's the Oxford one, is quite deteriorated, or it, it, it was a, a poor casting, and how those things um, have played out. You know, they... Well, I, I, obviously, I think I would leave Cecily Holberg and, and the uh, experts around her to first analyze and, and comment, but what I can say is they're very subtly different. Uh, some of them not so subtly different, some of them different sizes, some of them subtly different sizes, some of them clearly reworked differently in the wax by different hands. So I think there will be 
a lot of issues that come out by having scans made with the same scanning systems, output with the same 3D printing systems, all brought, brought together. So um, different people can look at them. And for me, the greatest advantage of what uh, digital technology is doing is that it allows uh, people to look at the same data, to share the same data, and to talk about it. So it's normally uh, in discussions like the discussions that Anna de Benedetti arranged uh, with uh, groups of different experts at the VA during the recording of the, of, the, of the cartoons, that actually ideas percolate. So, you know, if the role of a catalogue resume uh, is to do anything, it's to enhance knowledge through bringing together a collectively agreed um, canon of works that can facilitate in-depth uh, conversation. So what I would love to see is this new technology, which brings a forensic accuracy, forensic uh, level of objective study uh, to allow us to eradicate false information and focus on uh, things that could be collectively agreed in different ways. Well, I think that last point is really powerful and it's very important. Thinking of the work that you've just done on Medardo Rosso, I've been looking at the scans there. And there, if, am I right in saying they're white light scanning? Uh, the images that I have are monotone. Yeah. They're, they're, they're white light scans backed up with high resolution photogrammetry. Yeah. Right. The, the thing that I gleaned from those and being able to compare side by side particular, uh, the same castings, but from different times or from different, different ownerships is way, if you take away the color, if you take away the apparent surface that you, you know, the, the clutter and visual nature, you know, the dustiness and everything else, and you're left with just a pure topography, wondrous things start to spring to light. I can now start to see spruce ups and positioning and start to marry potentially those that exist on one sculpture and those that exist on another sculpture. Um, and then start to think, well, there's a continuum of thought. There's a continuum that possibly Marado Rosso has in the way that he's controlling or making his work. This is exceptional. I mean, I think, I mean, I smile a little bit because as I think back to what you were talking about um, uh, in your presentation, um, when someone says to me, forging, I see someone with a hammer beating a piece of metal <laughs> or someone sitting in a studio trying to deceive somebody else. So I think this link between material evidence and truthfulness, I mean, one of the things that most people in the art world say to me uh, uh, is, you know, Adam, what Factum's doing is scary. And I, I always said, smile and say, well, it's only scary if, if you're somehow trying to cover something up. Our job is to reveal the truth, not to deceive anybody. So our facsimiles are easy to identify from the original because they're not in the same materials. Uh, if I'm doing a bronze, I mean, I think the whole question, and I'd love to come back to talking about bells because I want to think about whether we can recreate the voice of your bell that never had a voice. So your bell was made from elements that never rang. So I think even in here, there's a myth. And in a way, Andrew, we met uh, through the work trying to preserve the London Bell Foundry, the White yeah. Temple Bell Foundry. Um, and I think what's happening there is something very interesting. I mean, we lost the whole battle to save a 500, almost 500 year old Bell Foundry in the East End of London, where there's a tradition of bell making going back to the 12th century. That's very sad. but. That's because people don't value uh, the material skills that drive your life and that are the things you communicate. So um, what we tried to do there was to rethink bell making. So to say, can we bring new technologies and work with artists on bell related projects um, to revive bell making, to generate money, to put back in, to preserve the traditional skills, to allow us to understand the different stages involved in making a bell using a sand of loam casting. And we're currently working with Runway Kingdom down in, in, in Pangolin 
who's one of the great casters, and Pangolin is one of the great uh, foundries, and Runway's built something really amazing. And, you know, I think watching him working with Nigel Taylor from the Whitechapel Bell Foundry to rethink bell making using new technologies uh, with Grace and Perry's new end of COVID bell, which will be released very soon. So I think there's something going where um, for a period of time, many artists like Jeff Koons are interested in finish, in shininess, in things that never change and alter. And of course, everything changes and alters that's material. So um, in uh, the conversation we've always had, it's the materiality that's the subject. I think this is fantastic news. It's got a music to my ears. Um, and the whole thing of, I mean, Grace and Perry's wonderful bell, which I've seen images of, I would love to hear when it's finally cast, but you've managed to take the whole story to the next generation, to the next level. And by moving, although there's still harking back to the, the clay loam material and Nigel Taylor and that heritage, but giving it a new life, a new heritage is of profound importance. And I'd like to see where that goes. Well, I hope this, this um, brief, introduction to materiality can help to shape the discourse around the production of catalogue resonates and I hope catalogue resonates can embrace digitality in just the same way that you've been able to because I think uh, it's going to transform how we see and understand both works of the past but also uh, understand that in a way that shapes the future.